When Apple announced their end-to-end -end encryption, I had some questions. So Matt Howard from Vertrue joins me for a discussion about those implications. We talk about lots of issues related on this bonus episode of The Business of Tech. Matt, thanks for joining me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to chat. I wanted to have you on because we recently covered the changes Apple's made for their end-to-end -end encryption around cloud backup. And I covered the story and what the technical details are, but you work in the security space. What do you think about the importance of this announcement and what it really is? Yeah, I mean, I mean, certainly Virtue, uh, my company, works in the security space, but we also... Uh, spend a lot of time thinking about privacy and digital sovereignty um, as as arguably different but related topics. And I think that that's, that's what this is really all about. I mean, at the end of the day, um, we live in a world right now where um, still early, um, but, but large-scale tech providers like Apple, certainly Apple as a leader, uh, are beginning to compete uh, and differentiate based on their ability to communicate to customers, um, you know, that they're doing different things with respect to how they treat uh, security and privacy with respect to, you know, sensitive information that customers might store on their platforms. Um, and for a long time, people would talk about, oh, don't worry about it. Your data is encrypted, uh, you know, in transit and at rest. Um, and for a long time, people didn't ask questions about, well, great, it's encrypted, but who, who holds the keys to decrypt it? And, you know, we're now sort of evolving as an industry and a, as a result of a lot of different sort of tectonic shifts in the, in the uh, global economy, some of it coming from Europe with GDPR and the EU, US sort of data privacy framework there. Um, but Apple, as a leader on this uh, topic, has said to you know consumers who want to back up their iPhone in the iCloud, you can encrypt it yourself and you can control the keys. And that's a very big step forward for privacy. Where's that thinking about how much the user gets to control? Because it's a bit of a spectrum, right? You know, you can you can sacrifice, you know, security for convenience. And one of the reasons why it wasn't done before was the ability to restore. The downside here, of course, is now the users have to manage that themselves. You can go even further, I guess, but but where do you? Where do you really see that as an issue? Yeah, I mean I mean so so again, I'll I'll, I'll emphasize it's early days. Um you know, I I think uh, this, you know, if you've read any of Apple's documentation, speaking to a consumer that might actually want to encrypt their backup to iCloud and be the one to control the key, Apple's going way out of their way, as they should, to make sure that that person does everything uh, by the book to ensure that they don't lose the key. Because if they lose the key, then it's encrypted forever and no one's getting it back. Um, now that said, that's a lot of responsibility. And do you really want to take that amount of responsibility? You know, maybe, maybe not, but to the extent that you are, um, dare I say, um, a little bit more progressive with respect to this issue of digital sovereignty and the fact that your data is your data and no one else's, and therefore you should be the one to have the key to decrypt it and no one else, then yeah, you probably want to have that control. And it's not just Apple with iPhone backups to iCloud, we're seeing this play out across all of the major public cloud service providers, Google, Amazon, Azure, uh, big companies that store massive amounts of intellectual property and sensitive information in these public clouds are all basically doing variations of the same thing. You know, it's one thing to say that the data is encrypted at risk in the public cloud provider. It's another thing to say, okay, who holds those keys? And then it's another thing yet to say, okay, well, if my information's encrypted in the Azure cloud and Microsoft holds the keys, what if my company someday is involved in litigation or, God forbid, commercial, uh, sorry, uh, a criminal investigation? And what is the possibility that me as the owner of that information stored in the Azure cloud might be hit with something called a blind subpoena, where law enforcement could potentially go to Microsoft and say, decrypt Matt's information because you have the key. Now, this is, this is all happening, not frequently, but cl clearly drawing lines in the sand with respect to 
a fundamental issue that I think is still early, but both consumers and businesses alike are starting to ask themselves when I put more and more and more of my sensitive information in public cloud infrastructure, is it encrypted? And if so, who is the final arbiter of the decision to decrypt? Who holds the key? But not all companies are created equal, right? There's a difference between sort of Apple positioning as the pillar of privacy versus what Google's doing. What's your thinking on the way customers want to approach this from an end-user customer perspective? Well, well let's, let's be clear about a, a company like Google and, and Microsoft, for that matter. Um, even Amazon. Uh, but, but Google, since you brought it up, I mean, yes, they have a huge advertising business, which requires them to uh, understand and monetize massive amounts of data at scale. Um, that said, they're also a very large software company providing public cloud infrastructure to commercial enterprises, small, big, large enterprises, um, to for cloud compute, cloud storage, uh, cloud operations, and indeed both Microsoft and Google both are two of the world's dominant providers of cloud collaboration platforms. In Google's case, it's called Google Workspace with things like Docs, Sheets, Slides, and Gmail. Uh, in Microsoft's case, it's Office 365, and both of them have massive amounts of sensitive data that belongs at the end of the day to corporations stored in their public clouds. And the question is, if you're the CEO of a public corporation or any corporation, and you're doing business with Microsoft Office 365 and all of your sensitive documents are in their cloud, or Google for that matter, then the question is, okay, is that information truly sovereign to you and your corporation or not? And historically, I think the question hasn't been asked, quite frankly, because this you know, global transition to cloud everything has been a trend over the past five, 10 years. But now that we're here, it's a question that's definitely starting to get asked more and more by businesses. And I would submit one of the reasons it's being asked now more than ever is because we as consumers, many of us who own iPhones, go home at night and we get notified by Apple that there's this new capability that would allow us to be in possession of our own encryption keys for any backup we have in the iCloud. So to the extent that I understand that as a consumer, I'm like, wow, that's a really interesting, powerful piece of privacy that Apple's making available to me as a consumer. I might want to go back to the office tomorrow and ask about digital sovereignty as it relates to our corporate information stored in the Microsoft cloud or the Google cloud. Has that been your experience? Are customers asking this question? I think it's beginning to be asked. Certainly, uh, you know, when I say beginning, I mean, um, we are just now, for anyone who's been following along, sort of the saga of the GDPR and the Schrems litigation with the EU and the US and what was initially sort of referred to years ago as the safe harbor on the rules and regulations that govern how personal information could be transmitted from European countries back to US cloud providers. Uh, and subsequently, the what was called the EU-US Privacy Shield uh, both of those two frameworks were initially kind of deemed uh, inadequate by the EU courts. And then most recently, just last year, we now have a new agreement in principle that's designed to govern this. And so when you when you kind of look at all of that and you sort of like say, OK, companies have been thinking about this for a while now. And primarily in Europe, it's been driven by legal and regulatory action. I think the Apple uh, announcement a few months ago really is at scale going to open people's minds like me, like you, like our neighbors who have iPhones and back them up to the iCloud and have never even thought to ask the question, who has the encryption keys? And to the extent that they now know they can be the one to have the key to their sensitive data backed up in the Apple Cloud, Apple's doing one thing for sure, establishing itself as a pioneer in privacy and opening the minds of consumers, many of whom have day jobs for corporations who themselves are storing massive amounts of sensitive data in public cloud infrastructure like Google, Microsoft, and Amazon. And as a result, it's the first inning of the game, but it is going to get played. And it's going to get played, uh, I would argue, in a way where Google 
will start to compete against uh, Microsoft and Amazon. In fact, already is. Google itself, uh, just in the past year, made two major announcements with respect to Google Workspace, making available something called client-side encryption, so that if you're using Gmail or Docs or Sheets or Slides, you can subscribe to the Google Workspace client-side encryption service and the information that you're storing in the cloud with Google is encrypted before it ever leaves your browser. So Google doesn't have access to your information. It's ciphertext to them and you retain control over the key. It's the exact same thing that Apple's doing, but it's for commercial data stored in the Google cloud instead of consumer data backed up to an I iCloud. So where do you think this is going in terms of the end state or where this is all moving towards from an encryption perspective? Well, I would say where are we going from a privacy perspective is really the way to think about it. And, and I, I think we're going someplace like this. So, you know, years ago, I'm, I'm dating myself again. Um, years ago, uh, there was a book called Unsafe at Any Speed. Uh, it was written by a gentleman named, named Ralph Nader. I don't know if you recall it or not, but it was a book about the U.S. automobile industry uh, resisting um, calls for it to invest uh, substantial R&D into putting things like seatbelts and airbags into vehicles because safety was something that people should have more of in a vehicle that they buy from a Ford or General Motors. And there was a big fight about this and the automobile dealers uh, resisted for a long time. Uh, and eventually they capitulated and eventually they started putting seatbelts and airbags into cars. And now today, Almost every single commercial you see for every single car manufacturer globally is competing on safety features because safety, as it turns out, really matters to people who buy cars. And I think the future of cloud compute and compute everything is going to be similar. Like, I don't think enough people today or enough corporations today really step back and ask themselves the question, how important is my privacy? How sovereign is my data? How well protected is my intellectual property? The convenience of having cloud compute and cloud collaboration from, from Microsoft or Google outweighs the importance of their privacy for now. But that's changing. And in the future, I think people will begin to buy cloud services from vendors like Google or Microsoft or Amazon, in part based on how they perceive that vendor treating their data. The vendor that treats the data with the most respect the vendor that treats it with the highest quality of privacy controls, I think stands to win. Well, Matt, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having me. Enjoyed it. Thanks for your time and attention. Time is a finite resource, and I really value you giving me some of yours. If you like this video, you can let me know with a like of the video, and even more valuable, hitting the subscription button. My content is all free, and I use metrics like subscriptions to pay the bills so it has real value. The content here is produced under ethics guidelines posted at businessof.tech. If you're interested in more content like this, you can get access to content early via our Patreon at patreon.com slash MSP radio. It's our give what you want model where you set the value of what you think the content is worth. If you like this podcast, you can catch it daily as the five-minute news and commentary show, The Business of Tech, available on all your favorite podcatchers with links at businessof.tech. Just hit that big blue button to subscribe. Again, thank you for taking time out of your day to listen, and I really value the interaction. If you want to say something in the comments, I do respond and watch all that, and I look forward to talking to you next time.